Come join me on my second channel, Jaguar Gator 8, where we'll talk all things college football. New video drops every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch the latest video. And now, on with our feature presentation. The 1970 season was a year of change for the NFL. And I think we can agree that most of the changes put in place were good ones that benefited the game tremendously. It was the first year that the merger was official, meaning no longer were there two competing leagues in the National Football League and the American Football League. It was the first year that the wild card was put in place, allowing non-division winners to make it into the postseason, and preventing a scenario like what happened in 1967 with the Baltimore Colts, where they lost one game in the regular season and were undefeated heading into the final week, and they missed the playoffs. And it was the first year that Monday Night Football took place, which was a true game changer in how sports were viewed on television and was a pop culture phenomenon. You can learn more about the creation of Monday Night Football and how ABC was the only network that wanted it by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Many of the league's ideas and changes from 1970 were good things that helped grow the game to what it is today and were instrumental in shaping the NFL positively. This was not one of them. This was a disaster. In fact, I don't quite know what the NFL was even thinking with this idea, because at the start of 1970, the NFL decided to try something brand new and innovative with their broadcasts, and decided that they were going to expand their presence on the radio by broadcasting fake games that never even happened. And the result was so bad, so disastrous, and so panned that despite it intending to be a multi-year deal that could become a staple of sports radio, it lasted less than a year, and was cancelled before the season even ended. This is the story behind one of the stupidest broadcasting ideas in the history of the NFL. Before I talk about the failures of the broadcast and why it was such a disaster that never had a chance in the world at working, we need some context to understand what exactly this broadcast was. In 1970, there was a brand new company that was created by two men who previously worked for NFL Films and helped grow the upstart company to what it became. Those two men were Harry Weltman and Phil Harmon, and the company was a sports marketing group known as Javelin Sports Corporation. There is next to nothing about the history of this company, or what else this company does. Around the same time period, they produced a half-hour highlight show of the National Hockey League, and that's literally everything that I could find about what this company is. And this is the same guy that did a 15-minute video on Sonny Gibbs, a quarterback from the 1960s who never played a snap in the NFL. So that should tell you everything about how successful this company was when that was all I could find. If you want to watch that video, click the card in the upper right corner. And with the NFL investing heavily on the broadcasting front, especially with television, they saw an opportunity to try something new on a different front, with this one taking advantage of the radio, as well as the increased fascination and advancements with computer technology. With that, in April of 1970, the NFL and Javelin Sports announced the creation of a brand new radio broadcast called the Computerized NFL Game of the Week. The two sides agreed to a multi-year deal, with one report even saying that the deal was for as much as six years. Six years is an awfully long time in the broadcasting industry, especially with a company like this that was just created, but the two sides were that confident that this would be successful. How the broadcast worked was like this. Prior to the broadcast, there would be a 15-minute pregame show, which would preview the game in question. Once the pregame show was done, an hour-long broadcast of the game would be held, voiced by Charlie Jones. Jones was one of the primary voices that NBC used for their broadcast of the American Football League, and eventually would use for the AFC. So if you want an equivalent of what this would be today, imagine if Kevin Harlan was announcing this game. So just based off of that description, you're probably thinking, what's so bad about this? Well, here's the thing. None of the games were real. You see, it was not the actual game. It was not a replay of the game. It was not even a legitimate pregame show of the game where you had people break down matchups like you see on sports radio today. It was a completely fake game. It was a game that was taking place entirely via computer. Javelin would put in 400,000 plays into an IBM computer, and the computer would simulate how the game would play out based off a of team statistics from the previous two seasons, as well as in the middle of the season, how they were doing this year. On Monday, the computer is fed all the information. On Tuesday, the play-by-play -play of the game is printed out with the computer playing out all 60 minutes and 120 plus plays of the game. On Wednesday, the script is written for what Jones would say and would be recorded by Jones. Once that was done, the broadcast would be shipped to the over 100 stations across the country that would air the program. Then the program would be broadcast on Friday or Saturday, and the next week, the process would start all over again. And the team at Javelin Sports was thrilled with this idea and thought they had a surefire hit on their hands. 
And Steve Davis, one of the people who worked for the company, said on this program, it's like a perfect match. It's a pure matching of strengths, weaknesses, attitudes, and percentages of the two teams. Davis explained that this idea was the brainchild of Weltman and Harmon, who had that prior experience at NFL Films, and how they were confident that their computer would be more accurate than anything else. Davis said on the two men, they saw other computer shows, and they felt football would be better for computerization than other sports. It's more of a program documented game. You can forecast the possibilities with more precision than boxing, for example, or baseball. On one computer show, Sandy Koufax, a pitcher, hit a home run in the World Series. What the hell did they put in that computer? In ours, you won't see a player doing something he doesn't do. Taking a shot at the inaccuracies of other computer shows is a bold strategy, especially when we have no idea how the NFL computer is going to work. Surely this won't backfire at all. However, even though Javelin felt like they had a massive hit on their hands, there were many, and I mean many, problems with the show. While I could be here for hours talking about it, I pinpointed four major problems leading to the failure of this show, and leading to the disaster that it became. Keep in mind that while I'm breaking down these four points, unfortunately, there was no surviving footage of the show whatsoever, because finding any archival footage from 1970 television broadcasts is almost impossible. So you can imagine how finding any archival footage from 1970 radio broadcasts is. Number one, just the premise alone is absolutely ridiculous. I'm not entirely sure what the market is for a computerized game that never actually happened. Think of everything else you could listen to on the radio. You could listen to music. You could listen to people talking. Or you could listen to, oh, I don't know, live actual sporting events. There were many instances where the show would be broadcast on a Friday night against high school football or on a Saturday night against college football. If you give two people the option to listen to a radio broadcast of an actual game or a radio broadcast of a fake game, I don't think anyone is choosing the fake game. Heck, I love the NFL, as evidenced by the fact that I've made NFL history videos literally every single day for the last two years. I could probably count on two hands the number of days that I've taken off in that stretch. And there is no way I'm listening to a fake radio broadcast over a real-life sporting event. And in one of the worst instances of this, and in one of the stupidest broadcasting decisions I've ever heard in my life, KFI Radio is a radio station in Los Angeles, and they were airing the first game on Saturday, September 19th, which was the preview for the rematch in Super Bowl IV between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Minnesota Vikings. The radio broadcast was taking place at 6 o'clock Pacific Time. Do you want to know what was taking place at the same exact time? That's right, an actual NFL game! At the same time, the Chicago Bears were traveling on the road to take on the New York Giants. This meant that if you were a football fan in Los Angeles, you had the option to watch or listen to an actual NFL game with real-life people, or a completely fake broadcast for a game that wasn't happening. Gee, tough call. Number two, think of what the broadcast was. You had actual NFL players being announced by an actual NFL play-by-play -play man. You had crowd noise, so it sounded like the actual broadcast. Yes, the diehard fans of the broadcast, if they even existed, knew that this was fake. But think of people who tuned into the broadcast midway through and didn't hear the intro for the fact that this was a computerized game. You had people genuinely thinking that this was real. If you're watching a game of Madden being shown on TV, you know it's fake. But for something like this, there's nothing to indicate outside of the intro that it is fake. And if you don't think there were people out there who actually thought this was real, let's go back to 1938 for a brief history lesson on a thing called War of the Worlds. I'm not going to dive too much into the specifics of this, simply because there are many documentaries out there about what happened on that night, and because there's tons of info on it. But on October 30th, 1938, a radio broadcast by Orson Welles was being aired, which was a dramatic retelling of the 1898 novel of the same name. The broadcast was about a Martian invasion with live reports from places around the country, including Manhattan, detailing the chaotic state that the world was in because of this. Now, if you tuned in at the start, you knew that this was completely fake. But if you didn't hear the disclaimer at the very beginning, you genuinely thought that the world was coming to an end, and that this was a live news report. And let's just say that mass hysteria erupted because of it, because a good chunk of people thought it was real. Now, there are reports that said the actual panic caused by this was exaggerated, and that it wasn't as bad as history remembers it. However, one Australian newspaper said, never in the history of the United States had such a wave of terror swept the continent. And many newspapers led their front page the following day with that broadcast and the panic that it caused. Now obviously, a fake airing of a football game pales in comparison to the fake airing of the end of the world, 
And I don't think anyone thought that they were going to die over the fact that they heard on the radio that Len Dawson just threw a 25-yard pass. However, the point still stands that you had people who thought that the broadcast of the game was completely real. And even though the broadcast usually took place on Fridays or Saturdays, and never took place on Sundays, what did that matter? The NFL played some games that season on Fridays and Saturdays. Especially after their expansion into Monday Night Football, maybe some people thought that the league expanded into other days and wasn't just a Sunday sport anymore. Heck, as I said before, one station aired a fake broadcast directly against a real NFL game. In that regard, the NFL definitely did not think this one through. Number 3. Remember how I talked about the schedule of events for how this program got on the air with regards to inputting the 400,000 to 500,000 plays and then generating the script? Obviously, to do that, you need data. And the NFL is the one that is supposed to provide the data. Well, guess what the NFL forgot to do at times? Maybe it was negligence on their part. Or maybe it was the fact that the technology just wasn't very good, efficient, and reliable. But there were many times where Javelin would not receive any data from the NFL. Jim Ellison, an associate for Javelin, said, We fed 500,000 plays into the computer. That's why we rely on the league to supply information on the teams, which we weren't getting. Sometimes the information would arrive too late to use. Other times, it wouldn't come in at all. It's tough to have a computer simulation broadcast we don't exactly have anything to simulate, and that led to a ton of frustration on both sides, because not having the computer defeated the entire purpose of the computer show. Although it's not like the computer helped a lot, because perhaps the biggest problem with this was number four, and that's the fact that the computer was wildly inaccurate. Remember how when CBS had Mike Carey on as their officiating expert, and it was basically a guarantee that whatever Carey said, the exact opposite was going to happen? God bless Gene Steratore. Anyways, the same thing happened here. The whole appeal of the show was the fact that you had a computer predicting NFL games. The whole point was because football was supposedly the best and most accurate sport for computers. And yet, the computer was not even the slightest bit accurate in predicting its marquee games. To the point where, in an effort to save face, the program changed formats halfway through the season and went from predicting just one game to predicting every single game. Remember that to start off, they were only showing one game which is what makes this next minute or so predictions all the more laughable. In week one, the computer had the Kansas City Chiefs defeating the Minnesota Vikings by a final score of 23-20. The Vikings won 27-10. In week two, the computer predicted that the Oakland Raiders would defeat the San Diego Chargers by a final score of 17-13. That game ended in a 27-27 tie. In week three, the computer, perhaps learning from its mistakes in week one, predicted that the Minnesota Vikings would defeat their NFC Central rival, the Green Bay Packers. The Packers won 13-10. And in Week 4, the computer predicted that the Los Angeles Rams, thanks to four field goals by David Ray, would defeat the San Francisco 49ers by a final score of 19-17. The 49ers won 20-6. We were one month into the season, and the program had predicted the outcome of four games. The computer was 0-4. It got so bad that Javelin wound up making absolutely laughable efforts to try and save face. And I truly mean laughable efforts. After their 0-4 start, the operators put out a statement insisting that they were closer than the actual odds makers were in predicting the true spread and outcome of the game. In other words, yes, we were wrong, but we weren't as wrong as those other guys. But then, they came out with a statement saying that the purpose of the program was to entertain, and it had nothing whatsoever to do with the odds makers. Steve Davis said, Don't forget, it's only entertainment. We're not trying to get into the bookmaking game or anything. Jim Ellison said, Our purpose was not to help certain people accurately predict winners. It was to provide entertainment to the public. So let me get this straight. You want nothing to do with betting, but hypothetically speaking, your record is supposedly better than the bettors. Interesting contradiction there. And people with the company even put out statements that they were not ashamed of their record, going as far as saying, well, what did you expect? Of course we're not going to be accurate. Ellison said, There's no way you can introduce psychological incident to the computer. You just hope that part comes out accurately. Did they say when they started the program out that they were taking attitudes into account? Funny how that works. Just to recap what Javelin's stance was here, we've got the most accurate computer in the world, and our goal is to do what all the other shows have not been able to do. However, even though football is the perfect sport for computerization, there's no accurate way to measure how a game is going to go. And sure, our predictions have been wrong, and we haven't won a game through the first month of the season, but at least our own four record isn't as bad as everyone else's. But if you're criticizing us, 
Screw you! The whole point wasn't to be accurate. It was to provide entertainment. The most important thing when creating a show is having a clear and identifiable purpose, vision, and identity. And it's clear that no one knew what the heck this was, and the goalposts kept moving as the show kept going on. And as time went on, the predictions continued to stink. In week 5, the computer had two predictions. And finally, they got it right. They predicted that the Baltimore Colts would defeat the New York Jets 24-16, and the Minnesota Vikings would defeat the Dallas Cowboys 13-10. But the way that the computer made these predictions was off the mark by a lot. The computer predicted that the Colts would trail 16-3 at the half, and then make a 21-point comeback, with Johnny Unitas throwing three touchdown passes in the second half, with two going to Roy Jefferson and one going to John Mackey. In actuality, the Colts led 26-5 at one point, and not a single offensive touchdown was scored by the Colts in the second half. I remember how the Vikings were supposed to win a nail-biter defensive battle against the Cowboys? The Vikings won 54-13 and were up 54-6 late in the fourth quarter. So even when the computer was right, they were dead wrong. And by week six, they were back to their losing ways, and perhaps their most infamous prediction of them all. And trust me, there were a lot of bad ones. They predicted that the Miami Dolphins would defeat the Cleveland Browns 24-23, and Paul Warfield would have 189 yards receiving and two touchdowns for Miami. He was going to go off. Yeah, the Dolphins got shut out. Great job, guys. In total, the computer went 4-7 in their 11 marquee games, which for a show that prided itself on accuracy, is very, very bad. And even though the deal was for six years, in early December, before the first season even ended, the plug was pulled. NFL Films was so unhappy with how the broadcast was turning out that they contacted the radio stations that aired this program and told them that they were no longer authorized to produce these fictional broadcasts. The two sides met to talk, but after one meeting, Tensions got so bad that the NFL called off all talks and immediately withdrew their authorization. Javelin wanted to settle the dispute in time for the playoffs, saying, We'll definitely be back on the air next season. But much like their computer prediction, it was wrong. And the simulated game of the week was no more. It didn't even survive one full season. Look, the NFL tried to do something creative and innovative. They tried to push the envelope. But everything about this idea just seemed like a train wreck waiting to happen especially since this was a startup company that really had no idea what they were doing. Nothing about this was going to work. When you combine the miscommunication and tensions between the NFL and Javelin, the fact that the whole execution of the concept was poor, and the fact that the computer itself was not highly accurate, there was no way that anything about this was going to succeed. They say that video killed the radio star, but in this instance, the radio did a pretty good job killing itself. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gator 9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.